Good morning and welcome to another edition of Mornings with Matthew. I'm Matthew Tregesser, your host, and today we'll be discussing the recent passing of Venezuela Temporary Protected Status, otherwise known as TPS in the House, new predicted apprehension figures at the southern border for the month of July, and lastly, a recent Supreme Court decision that allows the Pentagon to help fund the border wall along the southern border. So lots of stuff to talk about today, and joining me to discuss these topics is Ferris Preston Hennekins from our Government Relations Department. Preston, welcome back again. Good to see you. Yeah, good to be here. All right, so let's start out by describing what exactly is this temporary protected status. Uh, for our listeners out there, this is one of the least well-known immigration programs, but it's also one of the most highly abused um, so I guess for our listeners out there, I'll give a brief over- overview here and I guess add, add anything else you want to uh, after that. So uh, this program was developed in 1990 uh, and DHS, the Department of Homeland Security, grants this program to individuals whose country is experiencing some sort of extraordinary condition like a civil war or an environmental disaster like a hurricane or earthquake um, so in order for you to be eligible for this program, you have to be present in the U.S. within a certain time period that they um, make up, and your immigration status does not matter to apply for this. And the temporary relief program uh, lasts for 18 months with the option to get renewed. And when you're underneath this program, you have the ability to work legally, and it's kind of just like a um, a, a legal status for you and in, in hopes that, you know, when, when your country recovers from whatever disaster or conflict there was, you will go back. Um, so right now, 10 countries have it now, El Salvador, Haiti, Honduras, Nepal, Nicaragua, just to name a few. So am I missing anything else here, Preston, kind of the big overview of TPS? No, I mean, that's that's a pretty good uh, summation of the program. It, and it's really important, particularly in this instance, to remember that this is a program administered by the executive branch. Mm-hmm. So for Congress to, you know, pass a bill saying, you know, that they want to confer TPS on, on any group is, is pretty remarkable um, because that's never been done before. They've uh, in the instance of Venezuela, they've actually sent, you know, congressional letters to the administration requesting uh, temporary status for, for Venezuelans in the U S but, uh, it is entirely an executive branch program. Originally, it seems like this program had good intentions and it's been widely used by nations since 1990. But in your mind, are there problems granting this in general to countries around the world and especially here with Venezuela? Yeah, so people a lot of the time will think of this as you know this big humanitarian program when really it doesn't actually help anyone who is already in that country. Right, no, exactly. It only helps really illegal aliens and people who are on visas in the U.S. So and, and this is not a, you know, an official number, but if you think about, you know, let's think of a you know, fictional country that there's a natural disaster or something. Let's say two thirds of their nationals in the U.S. are here illegally. Mm-hmm. It's only going to help them. And then maybe the other third of people who are you know just traveling through the U.S. who they they don't have to go home. Right. Um, but the problem, like you brought up, is that it's an 18th month designation that is just, you know, signed repeatedly and, you know, and, it, and renewed frequently. And yeah. so what's interesting is so when the program first started in 1990, there's been about, uh, you know, more than a dozen countries that have been designated this. But I'm seeing here, I mean, if it's only meant for 18 months, a lot of these countries have been riding this program for decades. I mean, I'm seeing here Somalia. It was granted uh, designated TPS in 1991. It ended uh, in 2018. Bosnia, same thing. Uh, started in 1992, ended in 2000. So these are countries where it's meant to be a temporary temporary relief program, and ex- and now they're extended years at a time. And it's it's not it, it defeats the whole purpose of it being temporary. And I it, it's it, it's interesting to see how many countries have started to you know kind of use this and, and keep getting it renewed and renewed and renewed. Well, and there's in immigration, especially, there's nothing more permanent than a temporary solution. Mm-hmm. And that's what this has turned into. And even, you know, after, you know, and, and, you know, to an extent, you know, these people have been here for 20 some years. And so when the Trump administration, you know, rightly said, OK, you know, we're we're closing this down for Nepal. You know, conditions in Nepal are fine, mm-hmm. which, you know, they largely are. You know, they there were Nepalese nationals who sued the Trump administration because their temporary status was Mm -hmm. ending. 
Um, and I mean, that's that's a complete abuse of the program. It, it really is for people to avoid going home during a catastrophe. But, you know, once that catastrophe is over, that doesn't mean they get to stay in the U.S., work, go to school, start lives here. I mean, right. it, it, that's not what this program is was, was meant to be. But unfortunately, that's what it's turned into. Right. And the other thing, too, is if these people cannot go back to their countries and let's say there's like a civil war or some kind of governmental conflict, I mean, it's, it's kind of like you're pulling them away from making any institutional or social change there. I mean, if they have the ability to go back home, vote, maybe protest, uh, encourage others to join them to implement some type of change, they're not doing that. I mean, it's kind of like a a brain drain effect in, in some capacity. Exactly. It actually reminds me a lot of the diversity visa lottery in that mm -hmm. respect, because even though you wouldn't think of it as contributing to a brain drain, you know, it's not, that's not what it's meant to do. Right. But it ends up happening because the people who are best equipped to take advantage of, you know, this kind of program are people who are probably more affluent, who under, you know, mm -hmm. understand you know, not only the situation going on in their country, they understand American, you know, immigration law and whatnot. But, you know, those are some of the people who could probably, you know, do really great things for their country. And it's especially in the context of Venezuela, you know, mm -hmm. you don't want, you know, the only pro pro democracy activists to stay in the, staying US. In the yeah. U.S. You want them to eventually, you know, go back to Venezuela and, and repair the country. Right. So do you think that this bill has any chance of actually being implemented or do you think that it stands little chance of yeah of i i don't think so uh it it doesn't seem that there's any real appetite for it in the senate and president trump in the past has well first of all he's not only you know i said earlier that congress has sent him letters before mm -hmm. about this very uh situation he's you know rejected those calls for for tps uh and and in the context of this specific bill He's hinted that he would uh, veto it. Right. So, so I don't. Yeah, I don't think no that chance, it's. I think it's dead chance. on arrival in the Senate. Uh, and even if it does make it to the president's desk, I'm not sure that he'd sign it. Right. So, what else can we do to, to help stop this abuse? Because as fair as an organization, we actually support the concept of TPS, just not how it's been abused and kind of not used as temporary anymore. It's used as almost like an amnesty. So, do you have any recommendations on how can we how we can stop this abuse? Um, or is it, it's too hard to really make significant changes? No, um, actually, ironically, in the context, even though I personally think this is a bad bill, uh, I do think that it's important that TPS, uh, the conference of TPS be moved from the executive branch to Congress. Mm -hmm. I think it's very important that anything that has kind of implications lasting 20 years, which we've seen f from the early, you know, TPS grantees in, in the 90s. Uh, anything like that should be voted on. Uh, that's not something that the president should just be able to sign repeatedly every 18 months. And right. so I think it's important that if there is a situation that, you know, we think maybe we should grant TPS, you know, Congress should vote on it and the president should sign it. And most importantly, in that legislation, there should be a hard deadline so that exactly. it's not what I, we have now right. where you can just keep resigning it. There should be a hard deadline. And once that deadline is passed, you know, DHS has no no choice but to begin, you know, Absolutely. removing people. I, I think one thing, too, that would be interesting to explore is if there could be a limitation that, or your legal status could be considered when applying for this program. Because as you mentioned before, there are a lot of legal aliens within the mm -hmm. country who apply for this and it kind of prevents them from being deported. So if legal status was considered, I think that would be uh, a huge way to reform TPS and make sure abuse is not occurring and also protecting those that have... Uh, you know, openly violated our immigration laws. Yeah, no, I, th I actually think that's a really great idea. And it would be important maybe to just restrict it to people that have active visas yeah. who whose visas would expire during that, you know, whatever period of time Congress mm -hmm. agrees on for the hard deadline. But I think that would really ensure that people aren't taking advantage of it who just happen to be here. Right. So in other news, uh, it was predicted that July appreh apprehension figures at the southern border are set to decrease for the second consecutive month. Um, so in an interview with USCIS Acting Director Ken Cuccinelli, uh, he claims or he predicts that there will be a 25% drop from June and it'll hover around 80,000, which uh, has not been seen since February of this year. Uh, and last month, there were over 100,000 apprehensions. So, you know, about a 20,000% decrease or 20,000 
decrease and a 25% drop from last month. So um, is this drop a reason to celebrate? Uh, no, and I can tell you why. Uh, even though you know the numbers have dropped a little bit, that is generally what we expect in the summer as it gets hotter, mm -hmm. less people come. But I want to point out that if we're going with this 80,000 number that uh, Acting Director Cuccinelli brought up, that is still double what it was in July of fiscal year 2018, mm -hmm. um, which was about 40,000. And then in fiscal year 2017, it was only 25,000. So from fiscal year 2017 to, you know, if it's 80,000 now, mm -hmm. that's a 200% increase. That is which definitely is, alarming. Which is, so people say, oh, well, you know, it's not 100,000 like it was, you know, two months ago. Mm -hmm. Sure, but it's still, you know, if you look at the historic, you know, numbers going back to, I think, CBP has them until FY 2014, mm -hmm. 80,000 is, it blows them out of the water. And I think, you know, we have to remind ourselves that we're still in crisis mode, even if there is a 20,000, you know, drop in apprehensions. Right. You know, it's also interesting because he claims that uh, historically the apprehension totals between June and July decreased by decreased by about 6%, but now this is a 25% drop. I mean, do you think, I mean, isn't that a success in itself right there, or is it just an anomaly? It's too, I think it's too early to say. I know that he was really uh, excited about the progress we yeah. made with the migrant protection protocols, which is commonly known as the Remain in Mexico policy. Uh, he was touting some of the you know small tweaks to asylum that we've made, but I think we really need to caution against being too optimistic at this because we are still seeing ne nearly hundreds of thousands of people uh, in a in a month that traditionally is closer between twenty thousand and right. forty thousand. Yeah, I mean it's still alarming. Actually, I have a, a interesting stat here where it's actually a nine year high, the eighty thousand apprehension mark. Well. So <laughs> it goes beyond fiscal year twenty fourteen and up, you know, more than a decade. Um, but going off of the, the migrant protection protocols that you uh, just mentioned, I mean, 20,000 people have been sent back to south south of the border since January of this year. So, I mean, don't you think that that in itself is deterring people from actually wanting to cross over? And that's why we're seeing this drop. Well, and that's, you know, that is the purpose of, of the Remain in Mexico policy. It's to deter people who are trying to use the asylum system fraudulently. The people who have you know meritorious claims, they will they will have their day in court and they'll they'll go through it. And if they're one of the you know what is it now twenty percent of people who have a successful claim, they will mm -hmm. you know, be settled in the U.S. But you know for everyone else who who had been told by their smugglers, oh you know just come up, present yourself with a child or with your family, and you'll you'll get in. I think now that is a very important deterrent um, because now people are going to hear about that and say, well I'm not going to you know, travel all these miles if I'm right. just going to have to sit in Mexico. And so that may, you know, and ideally it may keep people from embarking on that dangerous journey. Yeah. Well, that, that also goes to show you that they're not necessarily genuinely fleeing persecution if they're kind of saying, well, you know, I don't want to wait in Mexico. Um, I want to be in the U.S. right now. And so that goes to show you that, you know, not everyone, but a, a, a sizable majority are economic migrants, which unfortunately doesn't qualify someone for asylum in this country. Um, but what about Mexico's interior enforcement as well? I mean, obviously the, the Trump tariff threat made them really get their stuff together and, you know, they've deployed 6,000 troops to the southern border. They're breaking up caravans within the interior of their country. I mean, do you think that that's been helping out and contributing to this decrease? Yeah, no, I, I do think it's been helping, certainly. And it would be, it would definitely be wrong to say that the steps Mexico has taken have not been helping. Um, you have to remember, you know, Mexico doesn't want these caravans and these groups of people staying in Mexico. And so I think the more pressure that the U.S. is able to put on Mexico by saying, hey, you know, we're, you know, we'll, we'll deal with these people in our court system, but they have to stay here. The longer, the, the, you know, those people are in Mexico, the more people in Mexico begin to say, hey, we don't want them here. Mm -hmm. um, and that's actually been revealed in polling. Uh, last month, there was a poll internally taken in Mexico that said the majority of respondents 
you know, they didn't want the Central Americans yeah. there um, for, for a lot of the same reasons. I, mean, it, that, you know, I don't know if you saw the stories in uh, Tijuana, this is maybe six months ago, but there was a lot of angry protesters, you know, Mexican mm-hmm. citizens who were upset about the number of, of migrants just, you know, kind of waiting around their cities, taking up the resources, leaving behind trash. I mean, it, it was a huge thing. Even the mayor of Tijuana, he, he expressed, you know, concern with the influx of, of migrants coming from Central America and elsewhere and kind of just, you know, remaining in Tijuana. Um, so what about the rest of this summer? Do you expect in August apprehensions? I know it's still way too mm-hmm. early, but I mean, do you expect another decrease or, I mean, you know, it's still going to be hot. It's still summertime. Um, and, you know, now we have the new asylum rule with, with Guatemala that was just signed. I mean, is it, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I would, I would actually imagine that we don't see another increase until October. Okay. Uh, that's usually in the past when, you know, apprehensions have kind of started to rise and, 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 uh, you know, get larger again. But, um, but, you know, barring in any kind of, you know, court decision or, you know, something that really changes the way that our current enforcement relationship with Mexico is working right now, or mm-hmm. if the, Gua- you know, we haven't seen what the Guatemala deal on, you know, we've paper. seen it on paper. Yeah. We haven't seen what it looks like in practice yet, but, uh, I would think based off of, you know, just historical, you know, patterns plus these new measures it'll probably decrease again but again i think it'll be larger than in you know august years past right and i, I can agree with that for our listeners out there this new um asylum rule with guatemala was just signed a few days ago and so basically uh if you are a migrant from central america or pretty much anywhere else but if you come through guatemala you have to apply for asylum there first before you can apply for asylum in the u.s so it remains to be seen what effect this will have. I mean, it, it's something that's brand new. Um, it's interesting to see that Guatemala signed on to this. Um, but I'm sure we'll see definitely some changing trends uh, in the upcoming future. So speaking of, you know, these apprehension figures, um, one way that has been debated for a while now is whether or not a constructed border wall would help reduce figures, apprehension figures at the southern border. And so recently, the Supreme Court ruled that the Pentagon actually has the ability to allocate $2.5 billion of its funding to help construct a fortified barrier along the southern border. So this was uh, big news. Uh, This was, you know, challenged by lower courts, and there was a lot of debate over this. Um, But the lawsuit uh, was actually brought up by a bunch of environmental groups. Uh, I think the Sierra Club was the leading. It is, yeah. The case is actually called Trump v. Sierra Club. Oh, (laughs) (laughs) there we go. Um, so they're the ones that, uh, that, that challenged the administration. Um, and so, you know, what is, what is the main takeaway from this, from this ruling and that it favored in favor of the administration and and the Pentagon? So it's important to realize for this case, this is actually a temporary measure because there Mm -hmm. are other similar lawsuits working their way up to the Supreme court. This particular case ruled that the uh, administration can actually begin using some of that money, even though they are still uh, being sued for similar things. Mm-hmm. So it just it just kind of took away that freeze on right. on the spending. But that's a really good window into the thinking of the of the current court. And you have to imagine using similar logic. Uh, you know, when they come back in October, if they have a case similar to this, that. Uh, you know, they're going to rule, it might be another five to four or th- mm-hmm. you know, six to three decision um, in favor of the administration. So, you know, as commander in chief, the president is supposed to protect the security of the nation. And so how can groups, you know, submit a lawsuit over this if, if the president is simply doing what he's supposed to do? It, What's the rationale behind that? It's it's you know they they have an agenda. It's uh it, you know it's kind of interesting, especially with the Sierra Club, who for for years uh you know in their kind of in their origin uh, actually did not support you know illegal immigration right. because it, yeah. because of its effect on the environment. But uh, they've you know very much you know abandoned that position in the past. But it's it no it really is kind of surprising, especially given. Uh, in my understanding of some of these cases, I'm not sure if this was the, you know, the exact point here in this particular one, but the the Pentagon actually is allocated, you know, more money generally than it actually spends every year. And so the president as, you know, the chief executive, um, you know, 
even outside of his role as the commander in chief, is able to allocate mm -hmm. some of that, you know, funding that is just, you know, not being used or, you know, if they have construction projects that they decide to cancel, that's money that can be moved. So um, it, and it, it's a substantial amount of money because it is the, I mean, the Defense Department gets billions mm -hmm. of dollars in spending every year. What I don't understand about the Sierra Club, in addition to, you know, their evolving stances over the years is, you know, why aren't they considering the amount of debris and kind of trash that a lot of these migrants are leaving behind as they make their journeys upward to the U.S. border? And even when they cross the U.S. border, um, you know, they cited in, in the lawsuit basically that, you know, constructing a uh, a border wall would have damaging effects on the environment along the southern border. But one thing that's not really talked about is kind of, you know, when, when you have this mass migration of millions of people, you know, of, of course they're going to have, you know, debris and, and stuff that they're carrying with them. And so, you know, there's not going to be readily available trash cans or recycling right. bins in the middle of the desert. So it's just being tossed around. And uh, the Center for Immigration Studies actually did an, an interesting report where they said that any illegal alien that was crossing the southern border was leaving behind about seven pounds in trash, which is, it may not seem like a lot, but when you add that up by a few hundred thousand up to a million, I mean, that's, a, that's taking a big toll on the environment. And so if you were to build, you know, a, a border wall, it would deter people from coming and ever making that journey. What I mean by that is people illegally coming and, right. you know, kind of preventing, you know, that phenomenon from happening. Right. And I mean, you have to think, too, you know, the bi one of the biggest threats to the environment is, you know, a, a growing population, just just in general. Yeah. And the biggest driver of population growth in the United States, at least in the past 100 years, has been immigration. And so, you know, that's not, not a controversial statement. It's just the way it is. Yeah. And so, you know, it I, I would I'm kind of surprised that the Sierra Club, you know, doesn't also you know, fight against that, you know, I, I can certainly understand why they, you know, come against the border wall because of, you know, oh, it's going to go through the butterfly sanctuary. And that, that was a lawsuit they they did early mm -hmm. in the Trump administration. But um, it's surprising me that they they can kind of turn a blind eye to these other, you know, very visible issues that, asso that are associated with environmental degradation and illegal yeah. immigration. And uh, for listeners out there, this funding is going to be, could be allocated to uh, existing fencing in Arizona, California, and New Mexico. So it's going to cover about 100 miles. Um, but do you think that this is enough funding? I mean, let's face it. Uh, Trump originally requested, I think it was $5.7 billion. Um, Ferris calculated that you, know, you need 15 to $25 billion to adequately build a border wall. It won't stretch, you know, every single mile of the 2,000 miles separating the U.S. from Mexico. But to make it, you know what is expected to control, regain control of our, our, our southern border. So is the funding enough? I mean, it's only a, a couple yeah, it's, billion. It's certainly better than nothing, yeah. uh, but it's it's like you brought up. It's nowhere near what even the administration originally in you know January 2017 had estimated that they needed, which was close to FAIR's number of, mm -hmm. of about 20 billion. But, uh, you know, the most recent, you know, September appropriations funding shutdown uh, debate, you know, that, uh, came from a disagreement over 5 billion in funding. So, you know, to, to get to about half of that, I think will leave president Trump, you know, content. Mm -hmm. Uh, but I'm, I'm sure that they're now also, you know, using this rationale, they'll probably be looking to other at, you know, maybe other places they can, you know, reallocate funding. Absolutely. I mean, I, I think, I hate to say it, but it is better than nothing. I mean, we're in, in a full security and humanitarian crisis at the southern border, and we need as much funding as possible. So, you know, can't really complain about $2.5 billion. I'm sure, you know, where they're going to build it is hot spots where there are a lot of, you know, people crossing illegally. And so um, going off of that, I mean, like, what is what is the importance of building a border wall? Because I know this has been debated for so long now, and it, it, there's two clear divides. But in your mind, what is the best thing about the border wall that will help with this crisis? Right. So I think it's important to recognize that, especially the way that our asylum system is being abused right now, the the wall will not fix everything. Right. I think the most important uh, aspect that the wall will solve is that it will drive people to go through the ports of entry as opposed to right now, people are just going across mm -hmm. and that leads, you know, that 
stretches the resources of Border Patrol. Mm -hmm. So if there were walls in between the ports of entry, that would allow Border Patrol to focus on who's coming in through there. Mm -hmm. You know, they'd be able to, you know, deal with asylum claims coming through there instead of having to patrol hundreds of miles across the desert just hoping to run into people. And so I think that's really key. It'll it'll allow us to focus more narrowly, but more, um, kind of losing the word, you know, just a, a better focus essentially at, at smaller. No, know, I, I agree. I mean, yeah. the, the, the wall would essentially funnel people into ports of entry where not only could they apply for asylum in the correct way, but also, you know, you can, if, if it's a vehicle or if it's, you know, people with, I, I don't know, luggage and stuff, they can get screened uh, better there. And, exactly. and you can see, you know, w- what's coming through the, the southern border. And at a time where we're facing one of the worst opioid crisis, crises uh, in, in, you know, many years, I mean, I think that's really something that needs to take priority is kind of, you know, having these people come through ports of entries, getting properly vetted and screened and making sure that, you know, uh, Americans are, are protected. Right. And I, I think it's important to think of the wall as just one tool in the toolbox. It's not a panacea fix. Mm-hmm. If we we could fund the entire wall tomorrow and build it next week, and there would still be thousands of people claiming asylum, um, and the wall wouldn't deter them. Mm-hmm. But but it's important to for those people to drive them to the points of entry instead of crossing in the middle of the desert. Right. And so for our listeners out there, the U.S.-Mexico border is shared by 2,000 miles. And so to put this in perspective, only about 700 of those 2,000 miles have any type of fencing, so about a third. And of that third, half is filled with vehicle fencing, meaning, I don't know if you guys have seen photos of this, but it's like these X type of looking uh, fencing on the ground that, you know, maybe go up, up two or three feet. So the primary objective of them is to stop vehicles, obviously, not really pedestrians. So I know there's there's natural barriers and all that, but I mean, it's still concerning that only a third of the wall or a third of the border has any type of a fencing or wall. But mm-hmm. hopefully with this funding, we can definitely expand that and kind of refocus on areas that have, you know, kind of a crumbling type of fencing. Uh, great stuff as always from Preston. Um, it's a pleasure to have you on every week. And I'm sure our listeners appreciate your insight here. Yeah, always fun to be on. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, for listeners out there, please tune in next week for another edition of Mornings with Matthew. And for more immigration-related content, please check us out on fairus.org. Uh, Have a great week, and we'll see you guys next week. 